We we'll now move on to item number 6A. It is the presentation by Dr. Robert G. Marbutt concerning the Volusia Safe Harbor. Thank you very much. I'm going to move very quickly so we allow more time for, for question and answer. And as a, a quick recap, I, I about two months ago, a month and a half ago, gave you the final report. It has seven recommendations plus there was another recommendation that was very important that was embedded in the preamble. And so to quickly go through that, one was to move from the environment of, of enabling versus engaging. And that has, I think, been really so far very good. Uh, the progress in that area has been, uh, that's the, a lot of the conversations within the agencies are on that, the public policy around that. So that I think that's been a, a big major improvement on where things stood uh, about a year ago. Uh, recommendation number two, which I'm going to hit a little uh, more detail below, is the Volusia Safe Harbor. Uh, and, and specifically, we added in the business plan. The business plan was vetted and and helped over a six month period uh, with Bill, myself, and Gary as the staff. And uh, we had a little over 60 people involved in that process over a six month period. And it was a very much of a collective work. We did everything from mission statement, scope, budgeting, design, location, agency interface, uh, how a board would look and such. And that's in that document. Extremely well vetted and, uh, and definitely a consensus report out of out of that group so it's it's been vetted very extensively and I'm going to talk about that one in a second then uh, recommendation number three which candidly is is taken on more legs and, and is really moving uh, really really well uh, known as Hope City and that was the recommendation of the need to move the families and children out of North Street out of the current existing home and so not there were several embedded components there one was we needed to move the family and children out of that neighborhood. That neighborhood's just not a safe neighborhood, not a good neighborhood. And it's also never good to mix chronic adults with family and children. There's nobody clinically in the country that would say that's a, a good idea. So one was we needed to separate. The next is we needed to right size. We needed a little bit of improvement on size. And then we also needed ability to deal with unaccompanied minors, unaccompanied children, and, and youth. And that project, Hope City, is going very, very very well, a lot of people involved in that, and, and that's me, it just, I couldn't be happier how well that's going. Items four, five, and six really depend on either getting Hope City up and or getting Volusia Safe Harbor up. They're all what I call back of the house, operational, mechanics, logistics. Uh, one is master case management. The other is taking HMIS, the management information system, from a scorekeeper to a tool of case management. And then the alignment of the feeding operations, hopefully getting the faith-based churches to, to feed at both those locations. Um, all three of those have been vetted out. The, the retired executives group, or I've heard them call the Dream Team, uh, several different uh, names. They're doing great work, and from what I hear from their report that's going to come out, uh, they're, they're really sort of filling out uh, the recommendations of four, five, and six, and so that, that's going uh, very well. And then the uh, harmonizing of ordinances across the county, you really can't do that until you get the other two done, but, but that's in play, that's sort of set up and ready to go, but you really can't do that until you you get a place uh, to work on. And the plus recommendation, it, it wasn't identified as a number, but it was a preamble. It was sort of that if you didn't do this, nothing else is going to work. If you remember just as recently as about 12 months ago, there was a lot of infighting between two major groups and two or three other groups on the side and a lot of things going on. And candidly, that put at jeopardy is the federal funding. And the last thing you, you know, when you're struggling to put all these pieces together, the last thing you want to do is risk getting the federal funding that we already have coming, let alone with the hope of maybe trying to get some more. But uh, that, that resolute, that, that, that resolved itself. The groups have, in essence, merged and are, are working together. And uh, just you know, about 12 months ago, we had major problems there. And so that's going well. So overall, many of the recommendations are making their way through. Uh, the big one we're here tonight is Volusia Safe Harbor. And I want to just focus on three issues. The, you have the report in front of you. It's about 65 pages. It includes the RECs. It includes the vetted business plan that we worked with with the citizens and community groups 
group for, throughout the county. But there's sort of three issues I want to sort of focus on out of the report. And the first is, if you want big change, you have to make big change. If you, it, it, it's that simple. If you really want to change the game, if you really want to make the community to save lives, to rechange the fabric of the community, to reboost the economic development, you're going to have to make some big changes. That, that's just the way it is. Communities that try gimmicks, little things, little things on the edges, only get little results and almost are always temporary and, and candidly more often than not move the cheese. You just move people around rather than address or solve, solve the issue. The other is if you pursue pie in the sky programs where you know you're never going to get the funding for that, uh, it, city for, and, and, and I put in this category and I'm, you know, as we've talked before from this lectern, Housing First really works well with families and children and also also seems to work very well with con congregate housing first works really well with veterans but the problem that many communities are finding is housing first funds are actually uh, decreased we're in the second year of decrease when they capped the the regular funding budget was there plus they also had stimulus money so off the total peak amount of money the the fed budgets depending on which category you use and such is 10 15 percent off some categories as high as 30 percent off and with the sequestration and the deal that was cut last couple of weeks the the operating base went up about one to two percent but all the stimulus money is gone and then the sequestration cuts are set to come in uh, going forward so Basically, the Fed dollars that you had two years ago is the peak amount of Fed dollars you're going to get. The, 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 there's the, the, if, if anybody gets new money, it's probably going to go to L.A. and New York because they're in both real crisis. And for those who are following the lack of money for Housing First today, the governor of New York, uh, liberal Democrat, uh, took on the mayor of, uh, of New York, also a liberal Democrat, and they took two different views. And basically, the governor said Housing First is not working. Uh, we don't have enough money to make it work the way it was originally idea designed because money was going up and up. And when it was going up and up, it works. But now that it's decreasing, so the governor signed a, an executive action today that said anybody that's not housed and, and it's 32 degrees or below has to be moved into shelters and the city of New York has to set up shelters and start putting it together. Los Angeles is also in crisis. They were supposed to have ended homelessness by using Housing First uh, by December 31st. Uh, not only did they miss that target, they changed the target. They originally said all homeless, then that went to chronic homeless, then they went to veterans and as of uh, last week, there are about 48 8,000 short just on the homeless veterans, let alone everybody. So if you pursue an option, make sure it's an option that's affordable and not, not a pie in the sky, or don't do gimmicks. You know, little, little things on the edges just won't move the ball and, and go. So that's number one. If you want big change, you got to make big change. It, it, it's really that simple. Uh, number two is Pottinger and sizing. Whatever you do, move forward. If you do move forward, don't get too caught up in exact sizing yet. Uh, you want to, the, the budget that uh, through the generous offer of the county, if that's accepted and moved forward on, you can build that out at about 250 spaces. That doesn't mean you had operated at 250, but you need to be able to have that surgeability. At the end of the month, just in Daytona Beach alone, and you could go to the, the best way to do is go to the Hum Kitchen line at the end of the month when federal checks are running out, runs about 175 people. And so if you build anything less than that to suit, you're not going to be Pottinger compliant. And if you're not Pottinger compliant, you set yourself up for lawsuits. And so whatever sizing you, sh you want to work on, I, I would suggest don't get too caught up into that now, build it the right size, and then you can operate it based off of how the program, because as you turn the program on, you're going to have some successes and drop some people, but then some people will come out of the wood, come in from the woods, and so you're going to have a, in one way you're going to have a curve going down, another way you're going to have a curve, and then you'll have a new number uh, that you'll get to. But if you start to look at, like, cutting the budget on the operational budget in the business plan, cutting it in half, 
there's certain items that if you turn the lights on, whether one person goes in or the 250th person, there's some set costs sunk with just having an operation going. So by cutting it in half or the size by half doesn't cut your budget in half. It probably cuts it maybe 25, 30%, so it really won't move it there. So the big thing is you think about sizing is really focus on the idea of always being Pottinger compliant. If you're always Pottinger compliant, you'll prevent lawsuits, you'll be in a far more humane position, and you'll be able to help people. So I suggest that you keep it at the design level that, that Bill Chapin uh, worked on with the agencies, set it to that, and then you can fiddle with the operating budget, but don't under-design something that would automatically put you not Pottinger compliant. And the third is, I would just beg that if you're going to move, it's time now is to take action. I, I have a sense that the door is closing uh, on this. You got a great opportunity with what the county has provided, $4 million of construction. Most communities I go to, we never can find that money. We never can find a partner to come up with that. And you, you actually have that on the table. But since I even just submitted my report, we've already had some people die just in my last report, let alone the, the report prior to that. People are dying in this community now, and, and it, in most of those deaths, a, a good portion, I think, probably would not be dying if you had a place that was operational. I also worry about the decay in the business community when you look at uh, future improvement projects and you see that they're just not going to, you could spend a lot of money in those areas, and, and unless you address the homeless issue, you're not going to get over that. That, that hurdle. Uh, Pottinger compliant, we talked about that one. If you, if you don't have a place that's Pottinger compliant, you, you're, you're going to put yourself at, 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 at suspect for lawsuits. Whether you win or lose is not the issue. You're going to get filed on, and then you're going to spend a lot of money in legal fees. Why not use that money for the facility? The third, and this is a little more practical, North Street as the, as the family project moves forward, it's going to open up North Street. When the family and children move out of there, if we do not have a new place that we design in a very proactive way, I think because of the way the ordinances are written, you'll probably just fill that back up rather than with family and children. That will de facto become uh, Volusia Safe Harbor. If, you, if not, and again, it's a de facto, you'll sort of back your way into it rather than making a decision saying, is that the best location, which I don't think is the best location. But that will become the location if you, if, when the family and children leave, if you don't have another alternative on the plate. Uh, the fourth is you got some temporary uh, things. I went out last night, middle of the night, when about one in the morning, went down and saw the encampment that's sort of developing at the county administration building. Those are going to start popping up. And uh, the problem is not getting any better. And if you don't take action and you don't create a place that's proactively designed right, you're going to start to get a lot of these temporary things that start popping up. And you can try to shut that one down. And I guarantee you another one's going to pop up over here. You're just going to be moving the cheese rather than, than, than solving it. Um, uh, the, the last two is, I'm candidly real worried. I, I, I worked back and forth with the county and the and different folks that the county offers now we're at month almost at month seven of a very generous offer from the county. Four million dollars plus land. That's a most cities I work with we, there's no offer like that ever and so there's an incredible offer on the table we're at seven months I don't know how long that will you know how perishable that is but if you lose that then then you've lost the game and you'll never you're probably never going to get that back and you and you won't get a, a a real solution and the last thing I would leave you with in terms of why uh, to move is things are only getting worse out there on the street and uh, by it, the more you do nothing or postpone or take votes later, things will only get worse. 
And so I, I would just suggest you got a sensible plan that's been vetted by the community uh, before you. And I, I think it, it, if you want to not lose time, uh, you know, think of it as an engineering construction at the very least, uh, move forward on design documents and, and get the, to the construction, the CD level, and take that, start, get that going, and finalize the site. And if you do that, you don't lose any time. You keep the ball moving, you keep it going. Uh, so at the very least, that would be my recommendation uh, to, to take on those two issues at the very least. If you can do more, that'd be great, but that'd be the very least. Okay. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments? Uh, well, I got a couple. Because mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the actually refer to themselves as the has been team and not the dream team. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Somebody said, okay. Um, but there, there are three people very, very knowledgeable in this community, right. and we're working on that. Um, and, you know, we're trying to be very realistic about what can happen. And we want something to happen this year. And a couple of things you've said give me concern because you talked about what the county's willing to pledge. Well, part of that was contingent on us having the operational funds. Right. And you know as well as I do, we don't have the commitments from the city. And I will tell you my own personal opinion and the opinion of those that are of the has-been team is that maybe you need to drop back and punt and look at what you can actually do and scale back and get something that is realistic that we can break ground on this year. And I hear you saying we shouldn't even consider that because we wouldn't be Pottinger compliant. That concerns me because we don't have the funding to operate a 250 bed shelter. Um, so if you're telling me we wouldn't be Pottinger compliant unless we do that, I'm not real sure how to move forward on some stuff. Well, what I, there are two parts to that. One is I think you still do, you design for 250. That doesn't mean you operate at 250. But it, why would you overbuild if you can come in at a lower cost? If you could build it for 200, 2 million, 100 bed shelter, and you can find the funding to do that, and you can get it open within a year, why wouldn't you build it with the design that if the need really, really shows up, that you can then expand it? Do you see what I'm getting at? Because uh, two parts there. One is I don't think once you spend that money on construction, you're not going to get it back. And the second is, I, I've done number analysis all across the country on sizing, I, and we spend a lot of time on that. And the 250 was not a just pull it out of the hat. Uh, originally, I, I was looking at about 200 to 225, and the, the longer you've gone, the problem is getting worse. And so, hypothetically, let's say, let, let's do the extreme, build it for 100. You're instantly non-compliant. Why? Because of what you just said. Yeah, but you, get, you don't meet Pottinger. If you build a hundred, if you build a hundred facility, you're not compliant right off the get go. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and I just look. All you have to do is go to the hum uh, lunch line at the end of the month. That's your peak number just for Daytona Beach. That's not a county number. That's a Daytona Beach number. So right off the top, you're not there. So you're talking about the program that we don't have the funding to operate right now. That's what I'm telling you. The cities haven't committed to do it. So I guess I'm asking you, what is plan B if it's not feasible for to us to operate this the way you've written this? Well, I, I'm writing something so you can be Pottinger compliant. That's why I'm trying to get you to Pottinger compliant because that was from the get-go one of the questions that are out there. A, to prevent lawsuits to be more humane, but also to successfully operate. Um, Could you describe, uh, uh, just for the audience purposes, uh, what the Pottinger case uh, is? The uh, Pottinger case was a case that started about 25 years ago. The plaintiff was Pottinger on behalf of a class action. Mm -hmm. ACLU was the primary lead uh, with that on the proponent's side. The defendant was Miami-Dade County. Uh, it, it went all the way up to the Federal Circuit Court in Atlanta, and it is the functional law for this fourth state area. It is guidance beyond this fourth state area, so we have to follow that law. That's not a local law. That's not a circuit. That, that is a federal uh, gone. It is a 
to attempts on both sides have been made to the Supreme Court to take the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has said that's what we're going to keep with. They have not, the, at least as of now, there have not even been four justices in the Supreme Court to change it. They believe in that. At least the U.S. Supreme Court does. I'm not saying you agree. I don't even agree with every part of it, but I'm just saying that's what the law is. It went for a re-agreement. Uh, both sides made some adjustments. They had a mutual consent decree, went back all the way up, was signed by the federal judge. And so about a year ago, they took the original case that had been around for about 20 years, and then they updated it. Both sides did some horse uh, trading on some issues. Uh, but that's your pot. That, that's the law. That's the defined law. And the short of it is you can't use ordinances uh, that are quality of life ordinances, sometimes called homeless ordinances, whatever you'd like to, to call it, unless you always have available space for the next person to go in and then it defines the five major areas you need bathrooms showers security safety food to, at 19 to 21 meals you want master case management etc so that's what the Pottinger case so it's the federal law that defines the ground rules on how police departments and cities interface with homeless so counties that have no services whatsoever which around us, there are counties with right. no shelters and no services. I guess they just don't worry about Pottinger? Yeah, well, they, you, you can't enforce any Pottinger type ordinances. That's the choice. So you, you, they choose to do nothing is what ends up happening in those sorts of counties. But most of the counties in Florida, uh, I don't know about other states, but in Florida are now moving toward trying to address that. Because there was a hope by some counties that the new Pottinger redefinition was going to lighten things up or loosen things or was actually going to be overturned by the judge. The judge said, we're not overturning it, we're keeping it. I don't mind if you do some small trades here and there between the ACLU and the Miami versus Dade. Uh, but there were a lot of counties that I think were hoping that was going to actually be overturned. It was not overturned. And so now that's the law of the land. Federal. Again, I'm not saying whether you agree or disagree. No, That's I'm just. Not. I'm trying to deal with what is. But yeah. nationally, there's also a debate about criminalization of homelessness, and that's in the courts as well. Right, right. But, but uh, again, you got to overturn something that's already just recently been refreshed by the Atlanta Circuit at the federal level. So, anything like that will take probably a decade. If it was successful, it'd probably take a decade to walk through. All because the Department of Justice says I have a friend of a court issue and that administration may change, you have equally about 26 attorney generals that have gone to the other side. And so none of those are going to play out anytime soon. So for the next 10 so years, you got what you got. Again, I'm not saying I agree or disagree. I deal in reality and that's what you have. Mm -hmm. um, the other reality for us is we've had homeless in the city for years. Correct. Um, we've had encampments for years. North Street grew out of what was going on at City Island. Mm -hmm. So this is not new. Um, and in different, and you can drive by North Street every day. Any of you can see there are homeless all over North Street where we have services right now. Um, so so it's, it's not a new issue for us, and you know that. Um, Excuse me, there will be no talking from the audience, so I will have to ask that you be removed. OK. Um, and this city, you know, we continue to try to address it and provide some services um, that are here. The, the, what we were trying to look at, and you have in front of you the commission, the goals that the group is trying to present, it's general kind of goals that you have there that are taking most, many of what you said, Dr. Marbot, and incorporating it into it and doing it in a global way, not just the Come As You Are shelter or right. Safe Harbor, but looking at Hope Place, looking at how um, North Street would be repurposed and serve maybe a specific population of homeless down Which there. Which would be perfect. Right. And medically and perfect needy. Use. Right. Being discharged from the hospital. Those are the two populations that we're actually discussing, and they're very targeted group, you know, of homeless that we would want I, to serve. I hear, well, again, I haven't met with the group, but from what I hear from individuals of the group is the either the what I call hospital outplacement bed yes. or hot beds or uh, or a disabled uh, perfect use of that, and that would not change what you're doing with your family and children no. or your adult chronic. In fact, any if anything, it would help augment that in a tremendous way because it would reduce the burden in the other locations. Right. So that's what we're looking at is is because we all know you don't do one size fits all. Um, the other piece that you talked about in your report that we're trying to pull together is um, the oversight. 
and the Global um, Committee and not creating a separate 501c3, but taking our existing continuum of care, and I know some of the members of the continuum of care are here tonight, and um, having it be more as uh, the Central Florida Commission on Homelessness where you have the business piece to it and we're actively working to pursue that. So. Again, we're trying to look at it globally. The real stumbling block that I truly see with this is, is the funding to operate. Um, what I'd like to see us do, though, is try to figure out a way, you know, to do it. I just don't know how to do it at the level, you know, that you're talking right. about doing it, you know? I, I don't think you and I are far apart. I would just have a reality. Well, so, yeah. yeah, well, go yeah. ahead, Mr. Chisholm. I think, I don't think we're far apart at all, because if you take uh, the handicap and the uh, hospitalized uh, Population. part and count that number in with beds that are at North Street and then what you're going to build out the other side. I think you're really yeah. going to be Podger compliant. Right. So I wouldn't get too excited about that that part of it. The, um, the part of the puzzle that has always been the difficulty is how do you fund the ongoing operations. And as all of you know, we've proposed uh, that the legislature take an action on some uh, food and beverage uh, bill that would be um, a source of funds dedicated to this effort. And we've not been able to get our Senate representative, who's chair of the um, Finance and Tax, uh, um, I can't remember what they call them, the committee, that would be responsible for um, allowing that to occur. We have not been able to get her to agree to do that. And that's going to be a stumbling block we're going to have to work on. Uh, I don't think we stop any of what we're doing. And I would suggest that we fully move forward with implementation of the, of the plan as outlined and include the, the goals and objectives that have been uh, brought forward by the committee, this, uh, the CEO committee of Wise and uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, let's get on a track of getting something done. And I fully intend to put my efforts to get uh, the county engaged and find a solution to how we how we can move forward in the construction. Because even the operating cost doesn't start day one; it starts basically a year later by the time you get through all the all the construction efforts. So. I think that's given us plenty of time to try to work out the uh, details there. But I would en encourage us to take an action to go forward with the plan and to integrate uh, jointly with this committee to try to uh, put this program uh, more than just on paper but in bricks and mortar so we can get it done. D Dr. Margaret, I get a question for you. The, so you're suggesting that we build it for 250 but open it for 50 well, if that's all we've got. Isn't that Pottinger non-compliant if we only have 50 beds? Yeah, but the key is don't build something that you know will never be Pottinger compliant. You know, and then you could start with 50. You know, even Volusia, uh, uh, you know, if you go into other places, you always phase in anyways because you you got to phase in staff, develop operational policies, adjust and tweak. And so I, I think you have to understand the surgeability too. You know, there's a graph, I think it was on page 30, you know, talked a little bit about the, the, the surging. You have two types of surges here. You got seasonal surges that come down with weather and then it drops. And so you can be Pottinger compliant during some of the year, Pottinger not compliant in another part of the year. And so that it's the least better than nothing. The other is during bad weather, you, you want to be able to always be able to surge up for the bad weather. Mm -hmm. So you can still design for 250 and operate at, say, 125, hypothetically pick a number, and then you're just choosing during that period of time, you're not Pottinger compliant, but, you, you know, 175 could be potentially Pottinger compliant during some times of the year, but not during other times of the year. Let me ask one more question on that, because Jim made a point that I had not thought about. It's 250 total beds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mats. Yeah, mats, mats or beds. Mats. Yeah, yeah. But if we had 100 on North Street, that's part of that 250. Right, exactly, okay. exactly. Right. And, and yeah. you really got more than that, because you got the families that are going to be taking care of a different yeah. place. We and can then do this. Okay. Yeah, veterans, yeah. So. What, what it, whatever, you, whatever you do on North, but you got to be careful on North to do logical subgroups yeah. so that, so it's self-contained, so it doesn't bleed both direct. You, you don't want to end up saying, I got to have a disability uh, system here 
that's maybe 80% of your individuals. And over here, I got four people, and you have to create a whole system there. You want to make sure the cost efficiencies are really working well. So whatever you do at North goes toward that number. And, do that. and then the funding piece that Jim talked about, I do want. And I do see Chet Bell sitting in the audience. Chet, I, know, I don't know if anybody else is here. But Chet, wave. Um, I just want you all to know they are phenomenal. They are such a wealth of knowledge. And they are donating their time to try to move this forward. So I applaud them. I really do. Thank you. I don't know if, if, if Ray Salazar or Randy Croy are here. Ray Salazar or Randy Croy. But they're, they're the other part of the team. So, that, so they... They are a great resource for us. But that's the other piece that we talked about is municipalities are only a small piece of the funding. It is um, the faith communities, not the faith group, but the faith communities and the business communities. And we all know they have to all be cogs in the wheel. And so that's You want an money from part. everybody. Right. And we're going after that and other funding sources. Right. You want money from everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I, have some, I have some questions. Um, Go ahead. Let me see. Um, these aren't, I'm not asking these in order of importance, just in kind of how they uh, appear in your report. The, um, most of my questions are about your strategic action recommendations. And you start off talking about um, changing the culture. And when we talk about the operations and who's going to operate it, it seems like there's a big piece that is very um, much an educational piece about educating people about panhandling, about ordinances. Absolutely. And how do you envision, um, who do you envision taking the charge for that, doing that? Well, I, I, if, if you go forward with this nonprofit group, which is really very close to what I have, you know, there was the one issue about whether agencies should be on or ex officio or vote or not, separate right. that, that issue. Uh, I think that would be your lead group, and that would be the natural group supported by the cities, the counties, the other so, uh, subgroups. Um, and, and um, Commissioner Woods, you were talking about a continuum of care group, and that's a 501c that already exists. Yeah, it, it, it will, it's a group that's not actually a 501c3, but it's a group that already exists that's set up by federal rules. It's a HUD required group. It's a HUD group. required group in which HUD you know, passes through. It can easily become the 501c3 policymaking oversight committee they would not provide direct service okay? and, and, and there's a reason why you want a 501c3 right. uh, you're absolutely right on because you want to be able to take the donations yes. uh, from there and you also want to reduce the you you know part of the reason I mean think back uh, just a year and a half ago there were two main groups fighting to do this and then some peripheral groups we got everybody together you don't want to have one group together continuum care and then another group start up you you want to streamline that governance and you, you want one sheriff okay, so town. what i'm hearing is we kind of have that um, we we have the entity structure. and in this county we can work together and do this so so that's we're, we're trying to move forward you know you need that. to file a 501c3 yes, that's yeah, really that's, what you got to do that's the easy part of it okay, okay. um my other question is um regarding the, the actual safe harbor structure. And um, there's a lot of references to the Pinellas County structure. And you know, having visited that and kind of followed that, that was very much, as I understood, uh, something that the, the um, sheriff's department via the jail, because their sheriff's department run the jail, really took the lead on that. And it was easy for them to, easier for them to get that going because they, um, they were using it uh, as, a, as a way to divert people Correct. from the jail, which was overcrowded. Mm -hmm. So there was a funding mechanism already in place because it was in the jail budget. Right. Um, as up to this point, have we had any conversations with our uh, jail, our county jail, about uh, funding or any sort of uh, partnership? I, I think there are details. I, I don't want to dodge your question. That's there has been no discussion at this point okay. that, that gets into that issue, but I, I'm not taking any of that off the table at this point. Okay. I think there's room for plenty of discussion about how to integrate services to create uh, efficiencies and at the same time not adversely impact uh, in the operations of any of their uh, uh, their organizational efforts. Because I think the, the frustration that, that prompted Pinellas, and you obviously know way more about it than I do, but was just a, a sheer overcrowding um, coupled with the pressure that was happening with the um, St. Was it St. Pete and the, the yeah. downtown area there. Um, yeah, and you're absolutely right. You had a 
three things happened almost mm -hmm. simultaneously. He had an overcrowding of the jail because roughly 400 people in jail were homeless over right. Mickey Mouse stuff. I mean, right. really, my... We were, and, I mean, and, they and, were criminalizing homelessness, which is what we're talking about Which now. we you, don't want to do, and you never get recovery there. And then you had two main cities plus three or four smaller cities mm -hmm. that were having problems on within the business community. And then you had an overcrowding inside the emergency rooms. And you always got to... The good news is the medical community here has been stepping up yeah. and has agreed to support this uh, because it's their enlightened self-interest. It's you know, and it's everybody's mm -hmm. because right now you got three medical districts in the county that are all overloaded, and you have a lot of homeless individuals hitting the most expensive part of the medical system mm -hmm. for something that's really primary care yeah. related, and it clogs up and costs money for everybody. Yeah. So I've noticed that what you said. I mean, that from the medical standpoint, um, you know, we make you make reference to. Uh, it, you do in your report, but also the community at large has made reference to all this money we're spending on homelessness, and yet we're, we don't know where to get the money. Uh, we know we're spending the money in all these places, but we can't figure out how to fund operations for uh, a shelter. So um, it, it, it seems as if the medical community has come on board. Um, I would like to, to see um, how we can how we access some of the money that could be saved uh, from the jail diversion. And also, there's a lot of reference in, in this and some of the literature that you provided regarding the um, clogging up our court systems. And, and you know, the, they're, you know, because of the way they're structured, right. um, which is different than here. But it is, I think, an important part. Uh, while we're on that, that subject, the um, Pinellas County seemed to have a very... Um, law enforcement model. And I think we've decided to go more um, of a social of service. Of an agency. An model. agency yeah. model. And um, in your budget, there's some money for contract security. Are you seeing that being some sort of a partnership with the police? Uh, but, or po just yeah, possibly. And when we initially spent a lot of time mm -hmm. with that issue with Troy and now more yeah. recently Mark, um, the, the, the agencies here have more value in an agency-oriented model. And I've done both models. Right. You know, San Antonio is one extreme, but Pinellas is the other. And it's sort of the issue of do you put more emphasis on safety and security or do you put more aid, aid, uh, emphasis on recovery? And there's mm -hmm. a trade-off. And there's pros to both sides. I mean, yeah. I see both sides. But but the HUM is such a strong agency. Okay. And they, they feel they have security understood and they, they already deal with that now and their reliance, uh, relationship reliance. And mm -hmm. so that can be with the police department, it could be contract security, it could be a mix, which probably what I'd guess it would end up being. But, uh, or you could ask other cities to help. You know, we talked about all of that in yeah. our community. And that group. can be worked out. So on next steps, you referenced um, moving forward with the design documents. And um, you're, you're talking about the design documents for the structure. Correct. And Funding for uh, there would be some soft cost dollars involved in that, so right. that was something we'd have to figure out since there's no formal understanding about who's going to come up with the money to run this thing. Um, we would have to figure out who's going to come up with the money to pay to mo keep the ball moving and getting those design documents, um, you know, architecture and all that stuff done. Because the, the, the two. I think that's really part of what uh, that four million dollars is for is for construction and and design is a part of construction costs. Right, that. but as Commissioner Woods referenced, we may not be able to tap into that money until we have an operational. Plan. I think we've I think, got to meet with I the think county. That's yeah. some of what we got to get resolved yeah, with the county. He's going to meet with the county and okay. see how we can move it forward. Um, yeah. Okay. So I, I think building that structure, and when you keep reference, when you keep talking about Pottinger and the structure and building it, it what are are you trying to basically say that? build the shell and go ahead and build the shell so that it can accommodate 250 people. But because right. I mean, once you start with the shell, it's not that much more money to make it a couple more, you know, to add some square feet to it. If, if you undersize the build, right. the second build is way more expensive. Exactly. If you right size the build from the get go, it's more cost effective, and then you have the ability to to surge. and It's a living organism. It, it you know that's why you can literally be Pottinger compliant because you have such a swing on weather here. You can be Pottinger compliant some part of the year and non Pottinger compliant, and you maybe you say maybe part of the compromise is you say we're going to be Pottinger compliant nine months of the year, mm -hmm. and then three months of the year we can't do. X. Right, but that's, you just change your operations. Right. You're, you're not changing the Right, and no. that's how, I think you got to adjust that on the operating side, but you know we have to search for weather, mm -hmm. you know, weather trends, 
you know, the cold, two cold winters we had right in a row surged our population here. The other is bad weather days, which we already had about 10 of them a year, you know, that the continuum and other people were involved in. And then you know what our number is in Daytona Beach. And so those factors, you know where those numbers are now. Mm -hmm. The one other thing I'd like for you to emphasize, because um, you mentioned it a little bit, the housing first and shelter. Um, we're not talking about an either or in this. Community. No, you I do, do want both. To say, we do both. Yeah. We all know that. That's part of the plan that we're talking about. And you still do transitional housing. Yeah. It's just the federal money is not going to come for those other things. Right. Okay. But we know those needs exist. The surveys are coming back in from the cities. We've heard from about nine, and, and we hope to have all of them before we do the final report. And it, it, on the east side, it's fairly consistent. We're seeing chronically single homeless, nonviolent offenders as you know, pretty high up, which again is is a population we're targeting in what you call is the come as you are center so the piece too that I know you've kind of touched on but I think is critical and people forget it's not just a place to house people dr. Marbit just cover a little bit about exactly what will go on there that case management it, piece it, if, if you just do a shelter it won't work because you put say 200 people move in over time 200 people will be there next year plus another 50 that come move in for next winter and such and so if you the way these work is if they're holistic in nature and they focus on recovery i always say if it, if you had a 19 year old daughter and she was off at college and you found out through facebook or the ann or or whatever and said we got a problem your, your daughter is binge drinking or whatever i always think of that what would you do if it's a 19 year old it, she's still an adult but she's still your child and she's in your you know sort of sphere of influence you would do everything you could to get her in a recovery program you'd it'd be 24 7 it would be voluntary you don't want to criminalize her. you're not going to call the police department up and say hey go arrest my daughter she's doing coke that's not what you're going to do either, but you're going to go intervene. I mean, that's what a loving parent's going to do. You're going to go intervene, and you're going to try to get recovery. Will recovery work on the first go? Maybe, maybe not, but you still try. And some people recover quicker. Some will recover in the first cycle. Some recover in, in a longer cycle. One of the things we learned in Pinellas when we first started to operate, our average recovery cycle in the beginning was like 2.7 cycles, which was a pretty good number. But now we're significantly significantly higher because you're dealing with people who have been on the street significantly longer. If you've been on the street for 25 years, to think you're going to get recovery in 28 days is naive. And so you need to allow for recovery. And so whether it's uh, substance abuse recovery or dealing with me, uh, behavioral mental health, on the other side, and a lot of this is med management and good counseling, you know, in combination. And Stuart Marchman is really good. It, you know, one of the reasons why we would like it to be adjacent or really near Stuart Marchman is because you have a gym in Stuart Marchman. I mean, what's incredible, most communities I go to, we have to build a Stuart Marchman from scratch. You already have that. You already have HUM that's really established. So you have two really good, strong anchors in this community to build off of. I, I have just one more question. The, there's the operating budget in here. I feel like there was a construction budget somewhere, but do we have an idea of what the design costs are? The uh, can I send Bill? I see Bill there. I don't yeah, Bill. I, I mean, would like, yield to Bill on, on that. I, and we don't have to answer me, but I would like to know that soon. I, I just want to know what kind of net we're trying to yeah. crack. He, he's, he worked that a couple different ways. I'll let him take just that. Just ballpark stuff. Bill Chapin, architect. Uh, this is the question architects never like to have to I know, answer. especially on the record. On so the, we, on the paper, but. But. Uh, let me just, I'll give you a couple of numbers and you can sort of play with them any way you wish. Uh, the building I designed, which is actually two buildings and some uh, connector buildings, is about 28,000 square feet. Uh, talking with Coleman Goodmoat, which is one of our premier construction companies here who helped me work on some of the budgeting thoughts on this, they think 75, 70 to 75 bucks a foot is what you could expect in terms of construction cost. We feel that we can find ways to pull that down a little bit as well. Uh, but as a commercial message, I'd also like to point out one thing. The thing is built and designed sort of like a, uh, um, uh, like a Walmart box. It's the cheapest construction you can do, but it's the most appropriate for this purpose. And it's designed with all the roofs facing 20 degrees towards the south so that as the future unfolds for us, uh, it will not only be a homeless shelter, it will be a solar farm, 
which is not insignificant. It'll start cranking out some real income that as time goes by will be a serious uh, contributor to the project. So I think that's probably as close as I can get to giving you a... Well, you're talking about the, the cost to build it, but are you think with the design, if we want to start getting into design, we need to start thinking about what it costs to just get the, the design documents Sure. Done. Um, we'd have to find out who's going to do that and what they're going to charge. And that would be a process which we undertake. Uh, but I would say that probably, um, you know, the, the, the norm for uh, completion of, of construction documents on something like this would be about 6 or 7% of the cost. Any other questions? Uh, no, not for me. Thank you. Thanks for the time Thanks. you put into this. Oh, yeah. Thanks yeah, for your time. volunteerism, yeah. Mr. Chapin. Oh, yeah, Mr. Chapin has been great. I was just thanking Bill Chapin for the time that he's donated to this yes. endeavor, and yeah. um, thanks for answering the question. Bill's been an incredible partner to work with. We talk regularly and often, had dinner right before we came over tonight. He's been ama you have an amazing asset in him in this community. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Okay. Do we have any other questions of uh, Dr. Marbot? Commissioner Gillette? Just, uh, just comments, not questions. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Marbury. Okay. Um, comments? So, um, we're basically exactly where we were a year ago. I mean, we've done, done some of the legwork, but we still have this funding problem. And if you remember, that's where I got dug my feet in the sand and said, we don't want to spend any money on this thing until we actually figure out how we're going to pay for it. And, you know, I, I had a, a bad feeling that when we started reaching out to the other cities that we were going to find that they were not inspired to contribute. Um, we need to come up with a model. We need to come up with some way that we can, we, I'm not comfortable building this thing and opening 50 beds because we've only got, you know, we've only identified half a million dollars or something we can use to, to, to operate it. Um, I do believe that there's a, if we, if we have a lot of different sources, you know, and Pam, you were hitting on some of this earlier in your comments with the private sector, you know, I think it's time for us to reach out to some of the faith community and say, you know, we, we want you to sign a contract that says, I w we will feed up to 200 people once a month you know, or once a week, or what, you know, depending on what their capabilities are, you know, or maybe you have some smaller churches that say, we'll do 50 people once a month, and you get four of them, we gotta, we, we've got to, we've got, we can find a way to remove that from our operating budget. Um, you know, the, the county, and I'm not sure if anybody's ever noticed this, but, you know, one of Jim Deneen's real MOs in, in life is to not experience, enter into things where he has recurring costs in the future. Uh, Orange Avenue is a great example. They gave us a couple million bucks, but we assume responsibility for all the future maintenance on it for a county road. This is the same thing. He, he wants to put the money up front, and I, gotta, I don't blame him. I, I think it's a great, a great position to take, and they're in a financial position with their reserves to be able to do that. You know, we are not to be able to put four million bucks up up front. Um, they were not interested in looking at it as a jail diversion program when we went through those discussions a year ago. So, I mean, we, it certainly can't hurt to ask again, but I'm, I don't think that one's very likely. But I think we really need to get down and tear apart that operating budget and figure out how much of this can we get through, through in-kind, you know, how much can we get through, uh, you know, faith-based organizations, community-based organizations, how much of it can we get through the private sector, you know, you know are there, you know, you know, what, can we get anything out of the cities? You know, a reduced amount. Um, you know. Mark, um, Mark, will you come up? Come up to the, please, and state your name in it. We're actually. We're, I'm, uh, I'm Mark Gellis from Halifax okay. Urban Ministries. Uh, Robert, one of the reasons when we presented our budget for the work we would do in running the shelter and feeding side of things, uh, a lot of people said our number was very low because we have already put in the fact that the faith groups that still come to us at North Street will continue with us and serve there. So very little of the budget uh, could be cut by looking for those commitments from the faith groups because we're already counting on them in the budget. But if you only looked at the ones that are currently working with HUM, there are many faith organizations in this county that don't currently engage with HUM. There are, and we 
kind of expanded that into the other meal periods because we currently only basically feed a, a lunch meal at North Street to the largest segment of the population. So we've kind of assumed that we could expand that to the others to cover and keep our costs stable as they are now uh, to get those other groups to cover the lunch and dinner. So I'm all about finding the yeah, solutions, yeah. but um, I'm not sure that that's a particular area that it, we've it, got it, much it may to not, save. But those are the kind of conversations we have. And by the way, thank you for everything you guys do because you're just you've done so much for our community and there are so many people who would be in far worse off than they are today if you guys haven't been here and been part of Volusia County and Daytona Beach. No, I appreciate that, but uh, so sometimes I feel like uh, our work just kind of keeps them where they're at and I look forward to the day that together it, we can move them Hopefully when we get to the on. end of this, you won't feel that way. Thanks. You know, we'll okay. be getting people off the street. Let me leave you with this about that. Mark and I are meeting Tuesday to revisit the business plan. I have reached out to some of the faith groups and one of the things that we are going to talk about is can we get commitments and that's part of what Chet Bell and the rest of us have talked about is can we get regular financial commitments from certain churches and certain things because then that becomes part of your budget if you know they're willing to do that. So that's a piece of what we know we need to do for the operating budget and we're trying to work on it. We are trying to get a more realistic operate. no I shouldn't say more realistic, we're revisiting visiting it now to, to make sure that what we've got in there makes sense. That's where we are with the operating budget, okay? And that's the key piece we're all talking about. And are there other funding sources, again, instead of just municipalities? That's what we're trying to do. It, in, you know, talking about the medical community earlier, you know, you, you've seen uh, Florida Hospital, you know, pledge, you know, significant dollars in the Orlando market. And, you know, they have been, you know, willing to engage. They've got new leadership, you know, at this point. Uh, you know, Halifax, I mean, you can't count how many things they've done to help out Daytona Beach over the, the, the many, many decades that they've been here. Um, you know, they have also been very interested in participating. But I think we need to figure out, you know, get commitments on what these folks are willing to do and, and how much, you know, will that help us address the funding that gap that we've got. So. Okay. Um, yeah, I got a Mr. couple of comments. Um, Pam, Pam, I think you're onto something with the faith-based community because, you know, a lot of churches have mission um, budgets and they send money all over the world. And we can, you know, we can at least look and try to tap into some of those larger congregations. I'm kind of thinking outside the box. I'm looking at, you know, Daytona Beach, we're supposed to take the lead. I understood that when we went into this that we would take the lead. So we take the lead. We come up with the majority of the money and the other cities come up with not so much money, yet they help fill up the, 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 the shelter. That, that's just an area of concern for me. I mean, I, mean, I, I just don't sit well with me that, that uh, we could possibly foot the majority of the bill and the other cities just, you know, they ship, ship their homeless population out to the shelter where, on our dime. And I think that's a conversation we're going to have to have with the other cities. That's going to have to go into, into how this plays out. Because if they're not willing to put anything up, what services should, should they get? And, you know, this is just something I just want us to think about. Well, that's, well. well, I've listened, listened to what all has been said this evening, and particularly what Commissioner Gilliland just said, that we're exactly where we were a year ago, today. And I would like to see us at least move forward on the design. We do it all the time. We design things, and when we have the money to build, we find the money to build. But I think we need to do something. And all the other, where the other income comes from, for all the needs, that we, that's a continual conversation. That's one that's going to continue beyond just designing. But I think we need to do something. Okay. Um, Commissioner Tracy? Well, I'd like to get started just as soon as we can. I don't know how many memos of understanding we have from the other cities, but um, I think a year is long enough. I think we need to get started as soon as possible. And um, if we cannot get everybody on board, we can't get everybody on board. Maybe they will come in later on. But uh, I understand we need to get the 501c3, which you said will be quickly. We need to get the memo of understanding from the other cities and from the faith faith and uh, present it to the uh, county and get started. Commissioner White. I would just close by wanting to define who, who, who has the task. So to me, there's two main tasks. One is the, the structure and getting the design money 
uh, how much is it and who's going to pay for it. And secondly, the other part of it is how are we going to run the thing and who is t having all these conversations, not how, but uh, where's the money coming from and who's having the conversations, getting the MOUs or whatever we need. Um, and those, those lines need to run at the right, same time. Parallel. So who, who, like, well, who um, does what? Okay, and, and, and I agree and I think that, first of all, I'd like to thank um, Commissioner Woods um, for all of her hard work. Uh, I know she didn't realize when I asked her to no. sit on that that it would be and it so would, much the answer would have work. been no yeah. <laughs> I can tell you that but, uh, <laughs> well I knew that it would be a lot of hard work and uh, Judge Schumann uh, who initially brought this um, to myself and others the city manager uh, and then took it to the uh, League of Mayor the uh, round table, round table uh, which you know she came with it as an idea of a jail diversion program uh, obviously it's not quite that idea, but the idea still is to try to remediate the uh, blight of homelessness, the scourge of homelessness. Um, and so, I, but I really want to thank you for the work that you've done, and I still want to thank her uh, for bringing this idea to the community. Uh, I think it's very clear, uh, and I know that a lot of people are here tonight uh, because they support uh, some action as it relates to uh, the homeless uh, population and the current situation that is uh, down on Beach Street. But I think the commission is very clear that the commitment that we have is it remains uh, and we're undaunted uh, by the challenges uh, that we face. Now we have to simply say uh, who's charged with what. I think that certainly our city manager, we have to sort of give him more marching orders to work with um, the county manager because the county does have a a deep interest in this project um, and, and the commitment of $4 million is not to be taken lightly, although my personal perspective is that I would like to see a more shared responsibility in terms of uh, the, the long-term <clears throat> operational costs in some way, uh, even if we had to shave off in another direction. But we have to give the manager his marching orders and I think that's what our action tonight has to be and certainly uh, Commissioner Woods to continue uh, with um, the group that she's been working with, uh, who really, that, that, that's the group that has to help bring everything right. together. Um, because this yeah. is kind of like a jigsaw and has to be put together from many uh, different directions. Um, but certainly I don't think there's any disagreement on our part. But I do want to say that as it relates to simply going out and uh, doing the design, you have to do everything simultaneously. Because it doesn't do any good to spend money on design and the other things don't work together. It Nobody wants to give money to something they don't think is going to happen. Yeah. So the sooner you get some something more tangible, I think the easier it is to... to Right, and that's why we're acutely aware that February is when we want to present our plan to the Roundtable of Cities. Um, we know we're under a deadline um, because we want to see something happen, and we know it needs to be some tangible things. There's a whole lot of moving parts, and we're mm -hmm. well aware of that. Jim and I have discussed this at length, and what I really would like for you all to give your blessings to tonight is that he move forward with the county mm -hmm. and the other municipalities that have expressed interest, and they're out there, to help us move this forward. And then we continue to move with trying to involve all those other, whether it's the businesses, the faith groups, um, individuals that want to support, and the organizations that exist. I mean, it's not just working with Halifax Urban Ministries, it's working with Salvation Army, and it's working with Neighborhood Center, and there's Family Renew that provides valuable service in this community to our families. And it's all of us collectively having that plan in the county to serve homeless. That's what our group is trying to move forward. Mm -hmm. and and so this is a piece of that, and all the other pieces are part of it, but to direct Jim to, to get this moving forward in, in the most uh, quickest way that we possibly can. I'd love to break ground before my term's up in November. I really would. That's my goal. Okay. So uh, what I'm hearing is that we have to be undaunted, we have to be resilient, and we have to give... Okay. Um, okay. The, you want me to make a motion? A motion? Yes. yes. We, okay. Uh, that would be appreciated. Okay. I move that we direct our city manager and staff to move forward with the Safe Harbor project to pursue it with the county and the municipalities that have expressed interest. Second. second. All right, we have a motion by Commissioner Woods and a second by Commissioner Traeger. Uh, do we have any questions or comments? 
Uh, hearing none, all those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Likes not opposed, same sign. This motion, once again, passes 7-0. So, Mr. Mayor, I did go through the... Uh, so using Bill's thumbnail sketch numbers that are, that are non-binding, right? It yes, just, they're uh, but if you use 6% costs, it's $70 for 28,000 square feet. It's $117,600. If you use the, the higher end of that range, it's $75 a square foot. It's 7%, it's $147. Or $147,000. Okay. So, you know, we're looking at 150000 is probably, you know, something that would be a reasonable number for us to target to say that's what it's going to take us to raise to be able to move forward with, you know, you know, engaging someone to do the design. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, Mr. Mayor, if I could make one more mm -hmm. comment before we move on. Um, the issue that, that, is right now in the city that we're receiving a lot of pressure to act on. I just want you to know that the city manager and I and others in the community organizations are talking about on some level trying to address some things right now. I don't want to go into detail, but I do just want to say for the record, um, there's been a lot of talk about what we need to do in the interim. We're not going to solve the problem in the interim, but we're trying to look at some things that we can possibly do and, and talking with some existing agencies within the county. And I'll just leave it at that, okay? And that's, that's appreciated, and I appreciate that effort as well. Um, but I say that nothing, and, and we've shown that, should take us off our no. objective that we've had and that we've established tonight. Okay, so that's, that's what. Right. Okay. Um, that said, um, does any member of the commission...